Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast, which delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought out by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 402, Think This, Not That, with guest Dr. Josh Axe. So Allie here, Becky is traveling with family as we're chatting in the summer here. And uh, this is such a fantastic conversation. I have admired the work of Dr. Axe for many years now. And really, as I've thought to him as a functional medicine leader and a health guru in traditional Chinese medicine, and of course, he's a chiropractor by background and trade, uh, it's lovely to see him talking a lot more about mental health, about the power of mind and our thoughts and how our thoughts can either create limiting narratives or can really propel us into realizing our greatest potential. Uh, Today's an awesome conversation. You will learn about his perspective on biblical medicine. We talk about some of the wrongdoings in allopathic or conventional medicine and break down side effects of many commonly prescribed and even over-the-counter medications in today's episode. We talk about victim mentality and how this can really disrupt optimal wellness and so much more. So stay tuned. We will be bringing him on, or I will be bringing him on shortly. Uh, Before we do that, just want to share with you listening live that we have some amazing updates here at Naturally Nourished. So as we are chatting in July, we are getting all ramped up for our 12-week food as medicine ketosis program that goes live on August 28th. In fact, mark your calendars because on Monday, July 29th, we'll be doing a free class to give you a little bit of a taste of how I approach a food as medicine ketogenic diet. It hybrids the constructs of Mediterranean eating and an anti-inflammatory approach while working with your macros so that you can use fat as fuel to accelerate body fat burn, enhance cognitive function and mental health, improve digestive health, and so much more. This is a program that I've been running now almost 15 years, and I can't tell you the thousands of people that I've helped to really take their health to the next level and sustainably make changes for whole body wellness where they're actually redefining their relationship with food. That's one of the favorite parts of the program is that when I hear people say, After 15 years or 20 years of trying everything, I finally feel like myself again. We have had individuals lose 40 to 60 pounds. Of course, some lose just 10 to 20, but it depends on what your goals are and your starting point. But we've seen upwards of 40 to 60 pounds of weight loss in this three-month program. We've seen individuals reverse diagnoses. So whether we're talking about fatty liver, whether we're talking about IBS, whether we're talking about hyperlipidemia or elevated lipids, or of course, prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, we see phenomenal outcomes by using our unique approach of an anti-inflammatory food as medicine keto. If you're keto curious, check out our free class on July 29th, and then mark your calendars. We will be doing a flash sale August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, where we're offering $75 off for this program. It's only $399 for the entire three months. You get a access to a Slack forum, which is basically a non-social media host hosted site where you can ask your direct questions. We have different chat boards here. You can do it on a phone app or just use it on your laptop. Uh, You can modify your alerts. So if you want a one, one daily email update of what's being discussed on the chat, or you want no notifications and just to log in at your leisure, this is where we troubleshoot things like sharing and modifying our favorite recipes. We have an area on sharing success stories or troubleshooting results. 
We have a section all about supplements and functional medicine, and then just general keto questions. And so that forum is live access for you over these three months. There's also weekly classes on Wednesdays at 12 Central Standard, and we rotate back and forth each week from a deep dive functional medicine topic balanced out with that following week doing a little bit more of a troubleshooting or integrating of the deep dive information and more of a casual chat type meeting. And so it's like a complex functional medicine PowerPoint lecture for about 75 to 90 minutes. And then the even weeks of your 12 weeks are done more as a group conversation where you have the option to maintain anonymity if you don't want to share your your face or your uh, name. Or you can have your camera on and ask questions over your microphone, etc. We have found, we did this as a first model last round in January, and we have found amazing results maintaining this continuum of care of every week instead of every other week. And so for just $3.99, or if you catch us on the flash and you purchase it on August 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, $75 off of that $3.99, you get 12 live classes, which are available by archive. You get access to our Slack chat to troubleshoot and get more advanced information. You get over 30 different customizable handout materials. You get both eBooks, Eat Fat, Get Skinny, as well as Ketogenic Kickstart. And you get savings on our supplements, which that in itself often pays off, as well as savings on our labs. And as we advance you through the 12 weeks, we troubleshoot things like hormones. We troubleshoot adrenal health and the role of stress on your metabolism. We talk about gut health and whether it'd be more appropriate to run an MRT inflammatory food panel or a stool test and how to do a beat the bloat gut cleanse if needed to layer in. We literally work with you to understand that root cause of what's going on in your body so that we can get best outcomes for whole body health over these 12 weeks together. You get to pick both Becky and my brains over this time. You get the accountability of having a weekly appointment with us. And I can tell you, I'm excited, I'm smiling ear to ear sharing it, that this is where you're gonna get amazing outcomes. It's an amazing return on investment. We will have more content going forward about, of course, Ozempic and some of the semi-glutide medications that are so buzzworthy and the side effects and the cost of $1,000 a month. So that would be $3,000 to see some potential similar weight loss. But of course, when you do our food as medicine keto, you're not dealing with the side effects. You're actually getting enhanced digestive function instead of dysfunction. You're going to see improved or maintained muscle mass instead of muscle wasting, and the benefits just continue to go on. So go on over to AllieMillerRD.com and check out under our books and programs the live 12-week Food as Medicine Ketosis class, and that kicks off August 21st. I hope you'll join us and mark your calendar to take advantage of the flash sale August 1st through the 3rd to grab your spot and save $75. All right, I am going to read Dr. Axe's bio and then I will bring him on. Dr. Josh Axe is a doctor of chiropractic, certified doctor of natural medicine, and clinical nutritionist with a passion to help people eat healthy and live a healthy lifestyle. In 2008, he started a functional medicine center in Nashville, which grew to become one of the most renowned clinics in the world. Think This, Not That was released in April of 2024 and quickly has become a New York Times bestseller. In Think This, Not That, Dr. Josh Axe unpacks the top 12 mental barriers holding people back from realizing their potential and becoming the greatest version of themselves. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished podcast, Dr. Axe. Hey, Ali. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited for today's conversation. And I think when most people think of you and your work, they think of ancient nutrition and bone broth protein powder. And, you know, they may know of you as a chiropractor, health guru, but I don't think that many think of Dr. Josh Axe in the world of mental health, purposeful living, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, or mindfulness at the top of the list. So I would love to hear about, you know, within this new book, Think This, Not That, 
how this became an area of focus. Uh, did something change dynamically in your life and that played a role or this has always been and it was just time to shine? Kind of give me the backstory there. Yeah, well, I'd say it's a few things. I said, one, it's always been a big part of the way that I practiced. Uh, I had a functional medicine practice in Nashville I ran for years. And one of the things I realized with patients very early on is that uh, our beliefs and mindset greatly impact how we heal. In fact, going all the way back to when my mom fought cancer and beat it naturally, uh, this was sort of my, you know, when I was about to open up my practice right before. And I realized that, you know, when she had cancer, that her believing she could heal was really a crucial part. This is also, I'm, I'm a I'm a Christian. I'm a big believer in biblical health principles and just the entire um, uh, Bible in terms of being the greatest resource ever for healing. And one sure. of the things we'll see Jesus reference constantly is by your faith, you are healed by your beliefs, mm. you're healed. And so I believe that our beliefs have a really big impact our, on our healing. And of course, I also knew the research around the placebo effect. Yes. And many people don't know sort of this background, but when you look at the placebo effect, it really started around um, the, it, it's, it's what, it's what really kicked off the way we do modern studies today. There was a, uh, the, a physician during world war one who was giving the fallen soldiers who had these really, uh, excruciating injuries, uh, morphine. And of course, again, people were losing limbs and major, major injuries, uh, and of course, morphine's a, a very strong drug. And he ran out of morphine. And so he thought, well, I can't give these soldiers nothing. I have to give them something. So he literally gave them sugar pills. Now, here's mm -hmm. what's crazy. 30 to 40% of them said when he gave them sugar pills, 30 to 40% of them said they felt the same level of pain relief as if they were taking morphine. They didn't know it. But think about that. Our own brains can create chemicals that are as strong as morphine to numb the body, to heal the body, to uh, help the body, uh, you know, get well. And so all that being said, that really impacted me. Now, when I set off to write this book, something crazy happened to me. I, I actually almost died. And that's not an exaggeration. I, the, the week I started writing this book, I went and got something done called stem cell. And I had injured my back lifting weights years before. And I'd gotten stem cell done once and it got my back back to like 95% or, or higher. I mean, I was back running, swimming, uh, deadlifting, squatting, but I had this little nagging injury uh, sometimes when I would travel. And I thought, well, I'm going to go and get stem cell done one more time. This is where they, it's natural procedure. They take your own stem cells, inject them into your body. And I did this in my disc, but after a few weeks, I started, I got it done. I felt worse and worse and worse. Finally, three months later, I woke up one day and couldn't walk. The pain was so excruciating. I had to have an ambulance come and pick me up in my house. Given I'd never been in the hospital before as a patient ever. So I had to have an ambulance come pick me up, bring me, get an MRI. The report came back that I had an infection in my disc, in my bone. It's called osteomyelitis where infection gets into the bone and then an mm. abscess by my spinal cord of the infection. And I then had to, I, we were living in, my wife and I lived between, uh, and fa family lived between Puerto Rico and Nashville, Tennessee. We were in Puerto Rico. I had to take a medical flight on a, on a plane to Florida, where then I sat down with an infectious disease specialist. And he said, Josh, listen, here's your reality for you. Best case scenario, you're going to have chronic pain the rest of your life. And you'll be the first person to know when bad weather comes through. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario is he said, this could kill you. This infection's right by your spinal cord. And he said, there's a really good chance you're going to be permanently disabled from this because of how bad the infection is and where it's at. He said, you may have to have rods put in your spine, um, but, and I'm going to recommend 12 weeks straight of antibiotics, six weeks of an IV, another mm. six weeks potentially of oral. And by the way, this, this all happened about, uh, you know, a year and eight months ago. Okay. And wow. so, so, so. As I was writing this book, I was going through this. And by the way, there are emotions, Ali, I had never experienced before, like hopelessness and despair after I got that diagnosis. Sure. But after about 48 hours, I said to myself, you know what? This is not serving me. I have a God that's bigger than my yeah. condition. And I just know that I, I can't focus on the outcome. I need to focus on doing everything I can to heal and just praying and trusting in God for the rest. And so I decided to start doing a lot of research. One of the, one of the medical, one of the studies I came across was on hyperbaric chambers and that you can cut down your antibiotic time to four weeks total. 
if you get in a hyperbaric chamber every day for 30 days. And I did that. I got in a hard chamber every day. I got IVs of silver, methylene blue, ozone, lots of nutrients. I only ate meat and vegetables, spending, you know, daily visualizing myself healing. Mm -hmm. And I was able to heal from this infection, do much less of an antibiotic time. And now, now actually I didn't walk for 10 months and then I got on a walker for two months. So I didn't walk on my own for a year. In fact, this time last year, I was just started walking on my own wow. um, as, we're, as we're doing this interview. But it, but one of the things that made me realize it even solidified in me as I was writing this book was really the healing power of mindset. And also that life is so much more than typically the things that we tend to focus on. I mean, so many people today are living without purpose, for example. You know, I had a friend yeah. come up to me as I was going through all of this and he said, hey, what have you been doing? And I said, hey, I'm actually taking some courses again at Johns Hopkins. I am writing this book. I am, you know, leading my company, spending time with my family. And he said, if I were you, I'd just be eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dew all day. <laughs> and I said, well, for me, I've got so much purpose. And right. again, st studies show only 25% of people know what their purpose is. And so in the book, I really dive deep into things like how to find your purpose, how to build an identity, how to just live your best life and do it with the power, a lot of it on, on changing the way that you think and winning the battle in your mind. And so that's a big part of sort of what birthed the book. And a lot of what I'm talking about today, which is um, not just growing, you know, physical health, but also mental and spiritual health. Oh, I can't agree enough. In in the anti-anxiety diet, I talk a lot about the nocebo effect, you know, the opposite of the placebo yes. effect of how negative thoughts can actually have a physiological response. You know, we can see epinephrine spiking, we can see cortisol response, we can see gut degradation and sterilization of our microbiome all from the belief of negative thoughts. And so I think that that's really wild with you having that awareness and hearing that diagnosis and then, you know, allowing a neutral yet positive perspective to, to push forward. I think it, it also resonates with me of thinking of, uh, this concept of, instead of asking why God, uh, you know, why did this happen to me? And, and this victim mentality, uh, instead, what God, what do you want me to do with this? How can this be purpose? Uh, I would love to kind of unpack a little bit there because I mean, this, this is like an ultimate victim stance that you were put into <laughs> a health vitality leader, you know, not walking. Uh, let's just talk about that. Maybe not in as extreme of dynamics, but I, I think all too often we're seeing this in society, the, the why me, um, and, and finding ourselves in a victim space. And I think that that was one of the tenets of your, your mind, your mindset was don't be the victim, be the hero. I'd love to hear, you know, how you identify with that personally, but then also how listeners can use that approach. Yeah. One of the things people have to realize is, and I had to do this for myself. So when I wasn't able to walk and I thought, Hey, I may not ever be able to work out again, like I used to, or do any of these things. I had to realize that those moments where I was feeling like a victim were not serving me. They weren't mm -hmm. helping me. They were keeping me from healing. And that's the first thing people need to realize when you start feeling sorry for yourself, woe is me. I, I and listen, no matter how bad it is. And by the way, I do want, I, I do have a level, a very high level of compassion for people. I know what it's like to have a mom go through cancer. I just recently lost my, who was my best friend and my father-in-law this last month and seeing my, my, who, who is unexpected. I just turned 60, thought he was going to live another 35 years. I know what it's like to have again, just go through some very, very hard times. And so I understand that, uh, and have compassion for people that are suffering, but again, here's the thing, feeling bad for yourself isn't, it, it doesn't help. It mm -hmm. doesn't help you. It, it, it tends to keep you stuck in the same place. If you are a victim, what victims do is they huddle in the corner and they don't move. They don't move. And so you don't move forward with your life. You don't maximize your life. Even if life gives you lemons, you just, you just sucked on, on lemons. You like, you want to make lemonade. And so <laughs> it's really important that people have the mindset of, okay, what is best? What is the mindset that's best going to serve me and lead to the best possible outcome? And a victim mentality doesn't do it. It leads you to the worst possible outcome. So the best is saying, I'm a hero. Every hero goes through a trial, you have to believe uh, and start moving forward with, you know, that you're going to do something great with your life. 
and believe it. And over time, you eventually will start to believe it. But I, that's what I would say is the big thing. I mean, the, the way that it works is this. When we watch any movie, read any great book, or look at anyone's life, including your own, people play one of four roles. They're, they're either the, the victim, the villain, the hero, or the guide. Victims mm -hmm. huddle in the corner. The hero and the villain both have pain inflicted upon them. They're both orphans oftentimes. I mean, look at Harry Potter, right? You got Voldemort and Harry Potter, okay? Sure. This is the way a lot of these stories kind of start off. The, 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 the hero uses their pain for good. The villain uses that exact, they have the exact same pain, the exact same childhood almost. But one uses it for evil. They take the evil that was inflicted upon them and they inflict that same thing upon others. And then the guide helps the hero navigate the situation, encourages them, gives them some wisdom and helps them uh, vi uh, become victorious. And so we all need to realize and you need to think about yourself. OK, right now, what what character am I being in the story? Am I being the vi villain? Am I being the victim? Am I being the hero? Am I being a guide? And make sure you're always being a hero or a guide when it comes to your own life story. Mm, I love that. And 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 so what would be like action steps, I guess, to to shift if you're if listeners are saying, oh, I might be that victim mentality. Uh, what what are kind of some of the first steps to to shift into action mode? Yeah, I think one of the things that all heroes have in common is they really want something. Uh -huh. You know, I think when, when, when I, and, and they also know, and they take ownership. And so, uh, let me give you an example for myself. And again, that's the best example I have, because I just went through this. Um, when I was told I may never walk again, or I'd have to be, have rods put in my spine and that I may, you know, uh, uh, when, when I, when I was told that, and I felt that hopelessness and despair, I realized, you know what? I, I don't want, I don't want that. What I want is to live my best life possible. I want to do the best I can. Three months later, here's something I love doing, Allie. I had a two-year-old. Her name is Arwen. And I loved throwing her air in the air in the pool. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a lot of dads do. Yeah. I, I want, I really wanted to do that again. I really wanted to be able to do a triathlon with her one day. I really wanted to. So I, I wanted to do that. Now, listen, sometimes we don't always get what we want, mm -hmm. but it's still important that we want something and we want it bad enough that we're willing to fight for it. And yeah. so for me, I wanted to be very active in swimming, biking, running, shooting a basketball, kicking a soccer ball and throwing my two-year-old daughter up in the air. I wanted that badly. And I said, I'm going to take full responsibility myself to do everything within my power, all yeah. the research, creating a strategy, everything I can in order to make that my reality. And that's what people need to do. What is it you want? Yes. Get certain about it, create a plan, go after it. Right. We do that in a lot of our programs and especially in my 12 week food is medicine program, we say, what is your hook, right? What's your anchor? Mm -hmm. And I love that visual of throwing your daughter. I, I have an eight-year-old now. And uh, I love that visual because there's a feeling, there's the weight of the body, there's the weightlessness when you release, there's the laughter, that unique laughter only a child being thrown in the air can make, <laughs> you know, there's the splash of the water. And that, that's the level that we try to get, right, with our clients is, is what does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Because when you're having those vulnerable times, you need this strong anchor hook to bring you back to the work, you know, to the why you're doing the work, the hard stuff. Um, and, and often when we have that perspective, I think that some of the hard stuff can become pleasure then. Then, then we are starting to fight the battle, I guess, right? Be the, be the victor in the, in the process. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about, um, how you broke up like these 12 minds, mind states, I guess they are, is that right? Um, and maybe identify one other one that you think would be helpful for listeners. I, I had written down the don't drift, clarify your purpose. <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, I could think of a lot of <laughs> Gen Xers that need that. Um, but, but we're, we're, I don't know, I'll let you kind of take it on as far as, uh, sure. one more of the bigger mindset things that you think would be helpful for my audience to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are so many. I'd encourage people to get the book. The book's called Think This, Not That. It's on Amazon.com. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's first week out. And so I think we've gotten really great reviews on people saying, hey, this really helped me shift yeah. the way that I think and my mindset helped me heal. And so, um, but, 
you know, one of them, I'll give you another, uh, I have been so blessed to have some people have a really big impact on my life. And one of the people that had the biggest impact on my life was my grandfather. And so this is one of the mind shifts. So I, I was at my grandfather's funeral about six and a half years ago. And, um, my grandfather, his name was Howard. He had an amazing life, lived to be 96 years old, was out working and, and, uh, impacting people up until the day that he died. And, um, I was at his funeral and there was a part there. They don't always do this at funerals, but, but this pastor did. So the pastor got up there and he said, at one point he said, does anyone have any final words they'd like to share about Howard? And within seconds, this man just yelled out sobbing. Howard was my best friend. And I looked over at him and, the, and I, I'm a little guilt. I'm a little ashamed to say this. The first thought that came to me was, I don't think you're, you're my grandfather's best friend. Cause my two uncles, you know, Don and this guy I think sure. were, but, 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 but then I was like, my heart just broke from, I thought, you know what? I'm sure he was your best friend. And I bet there of the 150 or so people in here, I, I bet that half the people in here felt like my grandfather was their best friend because he was that sort of guy. You know, have you ever met anyone like that? And, um, and he has a pretty unique story. My grandfather served in World War II in the Navy, almost died. He had a battleship war, like just amazing story. Got back from that, um, like hitchhiked across the country, visiting all these cities. And then he started working at a telephone company, worked there till he got in his mid forties. And at 44, he said, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Working outside, fixing telephone lines. He said, I want to do something where I'm building community and, and really serving people in a different way. And so he took his life savings, him and my grandmother, and bought this lake in Ohio. It's called Winona Lake now. And they built out this campground and uh, swim park. And um, people would hold retreats and family reunions there and all kinds of things. And he operated this from 44 till he was 96 for 52 years. And, um, and, and so anyways, going back to this, when I was at his, his funeral, one thing that really struck me was, okay what do I want my life to look like when I get to the end of my life? Mm -hmm. And I realized I want it to look similar to my grandfather. And from the standpoint of here, here's what's amazing. After that one man said, Howard was my best friend. That wasn't the last thing people said. I mean, somebody said, Howard saved my marriage. Uh, Howard led me to the Lord. Howard, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, was like the father I never had. I mean, thing, I mean, just so many people sharing these things, how my grandfather impacted them. And he was that sort of person. I mean, he was the sort of person who was constantly praying for people. I remember as a kid, I would live with them a little bit in the summers. And I would, every week, he would volunteer and go to the hospital and bring somebody their favorite meal, pray for them, and just sit with them for an hour or two. And I would go with him. And, um, and I remember just the impact that had on people. And so to me, one of the things I realized was success in life is not what we accomplish. It's who we become. Oh yeah. And, and most people think, oh no, success is, Hey, you, you make a certain amount of money or maybe you were, you know, you won an Olympic gold medal or you were, had a certain accolade, but, but it's really that that's not the real definition, definition of success. Even if you look at the Bible, the Bible is not saying you need to achieve this. No, you need to become like Christ. You need to become a certain type of person, higher in character, you know? And so I, and I realized someone else at the time or years before I admired and then sort of lost that admiration was Lance Armstrong. And it, it reminds me of this Bible verse and it's what good is gaining the world, but losing your soul. Yes. yes. And, and there are so many stories of people. Steve jobs is another one. I mean, you can create an Apple like company. Think about the success there. Think about winning seven tour de France titles, all that stuff. But if you gain the world and lose your soul, you can have all the accomplishments, all the achievements, and they mean nothing. And so if it's not towards the good. And so really how to maximize our life is this, and this is what I recognize with my grandfather. You need to grow in character to the highest degree. And then you need to grow in your unique gifts and skills that God has given you to your highest degree. And that's how you live your best life possible. If you're going to do something Use your gifts and take it to the absolute max. Like Michelangelo, like my wife and I were going to Italy here in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll go through the Sistine Chapel. I've seen it before. And I'm just in awe of what he did with his life where he took his gift that he was so uniquely good at and took it to the absolute max. max, uh, max. And then you have people like Mother Teresa and others who had their character and took it to the absolute, you know, incredibly high. 
And so, but, but again, and, and here's what this might look like for everybody. Um, okay. How do you go through life and become the best and, 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 and become rather than a, so rather than just having a to-do list, you need to have a to-be list. Okay. So as you're going through your day, for instance, if I go and I have a call, I, let's say I have to call a customer service representative today. Okay. And let's say they leave me on the phone for an hour and then I get on there and I'm mean to them, right? I, I'm impatient. I say something derogatory, trying to force my way. Okay. I might get the job done. I might check off one of the things on my to-do list, but on my to-be list over here, I wasn't kind. I wasn't compassionate. I wasn't loving. So, and that's the primary, the to-do list should be built upon the to-be list. And even your, your, your care, your, 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 Gifts should be built upon your character. And so all that being said, and uh, I'm very focused on, I think one of the mind shifts is here's how to be greater. Here's how to focus on becoming a greater person yourself. And I think that's a mind shift that everybody should focus on if they want to be successful. I love that. And and it's stark to to imagine even the concept of what would people say about me at my funeral, <laughs> you know, and who would show up and how can I be the type of person? I, I think that's one of the greatest compliments to have someone call you a best friend, right? <laughs> that's a, something we select, we choose, and uh, obviously models a good person, someone that someone wants to be around for sure. I love that. Uh, let's talk a little bit, one more in mind space before we go into food as medicine and some functional medicine uh, picking of your brain. I, this resonated with me. Uh, perhaps you're busy, but still feel empty. Um, I think that that might resonate with some listeners as well. I would love to hear, you know, what you mean by this and, and what is the solution? I, I mean, I think you kind of identified it in the to be versus to do, right? Of like task mastering, et cetera. Um, but how, how, do, how do we fill a void or, or have more yeah. present mind space or, or take joy in the mundane, you know, the, the making the school lunches, <laughs> the things that I find a lot of people... Yeah you know, washing dishes, I, you know, how do we find gratitude in the, in the daily tasks, the mundane and, and, and feel fulfilled? Yeah. Um, that was, a, that was several questions, but I'll answer, uh, <laughs> an, an, answer, answer most of them the best I can. And by the way, th th your, your general question, I think is such a good one. I, so a, a few quotes and ideas come to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, we're living in a world today where what people praise is your fortune and your fame. You know, your fame could be, how many Instagram followers do you have? Your fortune is your net worth. I mean, or what, you know, you, you drive a nice car. So that's that's what people tend to praise today. Um, and one of the big, the biggest way that, the people that are the most successful are the people that have the longest uh, they can do, they, they can delay gratification the longest. So everyone knows this study for the most part, there's a study called the marshmallow study. And here's what they did. They had two, they had kids and they said, you can have one marshmallow right now, or if you can wait 10 minutes, you get two marshmallows. They tracked these kids for years and they found mm -hmm. the kids that were the most successful were the kids that said, Hey, I can wait, I can delay gratification and I can wait to get two marshmallows. Basically it's, uh, you know, uh, work now and play later, or it, it's that sort of mentality. Now, now here's mm -hmm. what I want to do. Okay. That, that's with kids and that's for two minutes or, or 10 minutes. Okay. Now what's longer than 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years, uh, eternity. The people that have the longest perspective in terms of, I don't want to be successful just now. I want to be successful a hundred years from now or at the end of my life or for eternity. Those are the people that will have the best lives. The people that have those mind frames. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and he basically says this, the people that had the greatest impact in this life were the same people that thought the most about the next life mm. after we're gone from here. And so you want to develop an eternal perspective, an eternal mind frame. That's the first thing. The next thing is this, is understanding that while it is beneficial to talk to many people at once and build that sort of platform, um, the most important thing is to start with the people 
that you can have the greatest influence over. There, there's a quote by two quotes that I think really help sum this up. Uh, Mother Teresa said this, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Mm. And Andy Stanley said this, the greatest thing you might do in your entire life is not something you accomplish, but probably someone you raise. So as a parent, I mean, I can tell you this, my dad, I mean, nobody has had, I mean, I've had amazing mentors. I'm talking about, you know, a New York times bestseller who is probably the number one of the top doctors in the entire country. Uh, I had Jordan Rubin who built garden of life and an ancient nutrition. I've had, I mean, a pastor from reformed theological seminary. I've had, I've had so many people, I mean, unbelievable people. I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity to have Dave Ramsey speak into my life and Michael Hyatt and just amazing people. None of them have had a bigger impact on me than my dad. Sure. None of them. Yeah. And it's little things like this. My dad used to, you know, I used to work out with him. He used to wake up sometimes, you know, 530 in the morning, I'd work out with him or on the weekends he'd go and I didn't want to, but he'd go and shake me out of bed. At, you know, I'm like, dad, it's the weekend. It's like, Hey, you cannot sleep in past, you know, 659. He was there every Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, like come in the gym with me and work out, you know? And that stuck with me now. I mean, to this day and my mom praying for me before I went to bed. So my parents being very conscious about who I hung out with my mom, as you mentioned, making lunches, my mom making us dinner every night and saying, Hey, come in the kitchen and help do the dishes. And I want to show you how to cook this. So here's mm -hmm. the thing I'll, I'll, I'll say for parents, if you want to have a, a big model, 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 the greatest way you can help your kids grow in character is you being, you, you, you have great character yourself, especially in connection to your spouse, how spouses mm -hmm. treat each other is the great, is the, is the biggest indicator of how kids will treat other people. So, so invite to them, invite them into your mind mm -hmm. uh, and into, um, in a greater level of discipling them. And I think that's, that's the great, I mean, that right there is one of the greatest things we could ever do with our life. If we want to change the world, go home and, you know, yeah. it, it, there's another quote here by, um, by Confucius. And he said, if you want to feed people for a year, plant wheat. If you want to feed people for 10 years, plant walnut trees. Okay. And, and he said, if you want to change the world, or like shift an entire country, an entire society over a hundred years, educate children. Again, mm -hmm. these are very long-term approaches that focus on discipling people, especially kids. I love that. And I love bringing them to the table as far as beyond just food modeling, but in the world of discourse and uh, allowing them to watch the process of discernment <laughs> and to understand the whys behind the actions. And I, I just think they can't be, you don't have to wait for them to be a certain age uh, to speak to them with truth and with real world scenarios because they're sponging it all in <laughs> and they're either going to take it in from you or what they're observing in the secular space. Right. And so it's, I think definitely behoove of parents to to bring them in as early as possible into some of those complex conversations. Uh, sure. I mean, here's the, re here's the reality. Hitler had parents and so did mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. I mean, so <laughs> what you do with your kids yeah. is the most important job in the world. Love that. Good. Okay. Let's move on to food as medicine and some, some functional medicine stuff. So, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, since you've been in this for quite some time now, what are one or two things that maybe you used to practice with as an end all be all or a, an approach? I mean, I know everything's very N equals one individualized, but maybe one or two things that have evolved or shifted in maybe doctrine or thought patterns of either macros or nutritionism uh, that you've kind of redefined or adapted as you've learned new things or as you've seen things shift in the couple decades of your work? Mm, that's such a good question. I know, right? It's a hard one. Well, <laughs> like, well, well it's, a, it's a hard one, but it's a good one. So I, I, well, one thing I will say, I've almost always been on a, about a very personalized diet. Um, I, 
part of that is I've, I've, I've my, a big part of my training has been Chinese medicine and and biblical medicine. And I know God created everyone uniquely and Chinese medicine also looks at everybody and saying, you need a diet that's very specific to you. Um, and so one, that is something that hasn't changed. What, what has changed, I will say is, is that I am, um, a big believer that the biggest thing that affects our health is our mindset and emotional stress. Mm -hmm. even over diet. So I do think diet is critically important. I just think it's the second most critically important thing. Sure. I think, I think our, I mean, we, we, when you look at people in certain areas of the world, you know, they're not eating perfectly, but they have low stress levels and that will keep them very, very healthy. So, I, and, and you know, when I used to run my functional medicine practice, if I would have somebody come in, let's say with inflammatory bowel disease, um, if they would eat gluten or dairy, I mean, they would have major, you know, maybe major flare up, mm -hmm. but you know, what would cause a bigger flare up or an equal to flare up for IBS or Crohn's or colitis as gluten or dairy going through some emotional stress at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so we really need to focus on all those factors. I mean, health is not just body, it's body, mind, spirit, your spiritual and your physical health, your beliefs. If you have anxiety, depression, worry, uh, anger, those all have way, way more stress on our body than most of us give it credit for. I'll give you, you know, a couple examples of this in Chinese medicine, it's known, and th these are absolute facts that different emotions, uh, impact different organ systems. Mm -hmm. Now we know, for instance, like, uh, fear affects our adrenal glands, right? Our body starts putting out, puts, puts us in a fight or flight state, our adrenals start putting out adrenaline and, you know, cortisol, these stress hormones. So, so we know that to be true, but additionally, anger impacts our liver and gallbladder mm -hmm. grief or not letting go of things of the past that affects our lungs and colon. Um, anxiety can affect our heart rate and even our blood pressure. Um, worry affects our stomach, our digestive system. We've all heard, oh, somebody's worried about something they're getting that upsets their stomach. So, mm -hmm. so we know that different emotions impact different organ systems. And so the thing I've just continued to be convicted with and be even more aware of is we have to, just like I, just like I now prescribe somebody, if somebody comes in with, let's call it hypothyroidism, mm -hmm. I have a very, very specific protocol for the root cause of hypothyroidism. And some of them are diet related people with hypothyroidism. Most of them have been on birth control and mm -hmm. birth control. People don't realize this. If you've been on birth control long-term, your chance of having hypothyroidism goes up by 283.7%. Uh, because, uh, because, th uh, th uh, these, um, birth control medications pull and leach B vitamins out of your body. So then you can't methylate properly. And when you're not methylating properly, now your body can't produce, uh, a lot of the, the B vitamins necessary, like, like riboflavin, folate and B12 that are, that are necessary for then later on the conversion of even T3 to T4 to T3. So anyways, all that being said, so I know if I have somebody coming with hypothyroid, you need to eat red meat and we need to get some liver in. We need to have you do fish. I need to have you do, um, only cooked vegetables, no raw, uh, berries, and then I need to do ashwagandha, a methylated B complex, uh, very high dose probiotic, so you can absorb and methylate properly those B vitamins. My so I'm just getting real specific here. My point is there's a very very specific protocol for how I help people reverse Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. In addition, though, in Chinese medicine, hypothyroidism is known as a qi and yang deficiency. So it's really tied to uh, kid uh, qi is tied to your adrenals. So mm -hmm. people with hypothyroid, people are always trying to treat the thyroid. Well, it's almost always more of an adrenal issue. Mm -hmm. And then if it's Hashimoto's, it's more of a gut immune issue um, or, or combined, it's both. And so, but, but those have emotional components. And so most of the time, if your adrenals are low, people with uh, hypothyroid tend to be in a fight or flight state too much. They're, they're, they're volunteering for everything and they're raising kids and they're trying to work and take care of their husband and they're trying, and it's way more women. So they're, try, so they're constantly giving and, and they never, it's like, it's like having a battery down at like 20% running on empty yeah. a golf cart or something with, it just doesn't have any juice left. So it can't get that juice up to the thyroid to function and create those hormones. So, so you've got to create that downtime and really good restful periods where, 
where, the, where those women are doing nothing or where, where you're playing pickleball or you're going on a walk or reading a novel or doing so. So in working on building that emotional, mental, spiritual strength, that battery back up in order to heal. So my point with that is, is that I think one of the things I've just continued to know in the way I practice medicine now is very much, very, very specific, very plan oriented with a plan nutritionally, but also a plan laid out on that spiritual, mental, emotional plane of how mm -hmm. to recharge those batteries as well. And so are you giving more recommendations in that space of either somatic release or vagus nerve activation yeah. or sunrise, yeah. sunset? What are some of the kind yeah. of like tangible prescriptive yeah. changes, I guess? I'd love to hear some of those. Yeah, well, let me give you the biggest needle mover of all. I have people write down the things they love to do most in this world. What do you love to do? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example with my mom when I did this with her. My mom wrote down riding horses. Okay. Mm -hmm. She also wrote down, uh, you know, playing, you know, spending time with her grandkids. She also wrote down walking in the park, walking in nature. You know, she wrote down reading, you know, these certain books she likes. And so she had a full list there and then going boating with my dad on the water. Okay. Those are the things. And then I just have her go and schedule a lot of those things, the things uh -huh. that she loves and enjoys doing. That'll work better than anything else we could mention. Okay. So that's number one. You just need to schedule doing more things that build peace and that you love to do. Yeah. The second thing is, again, I think walking in nature in the morning and in the e three times a day around mm -hmm. your meals. So mm -hmm. if you can get out time, outside three times a day, it's like a triple whammy. In the morning, you start getting those cortisol melatonin levels balanced and sort of getting that system reset, plus you're walking and, and do a gratitude practice. Okay. So do that in the morning. Mm -hmm. Wow. What that does for your body. Then in the afternoon around lunch, you're outside again, getting more of that, the vitamin D that you really need. Plus you're walking in the evening, walk around dinner. And I'm talking about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. So you're walking, try and walk an hour a day. That, that does an incredible for digestion as well around your meal mm -hmm. times. And so, in fact, in fact, one of the recommendations in Chinese medicine was that, so we say in, in the Western world, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Mm -hmm. What, what they say in Chinese medicine is 10,000 steps a day keeps the doctor away. Sure. And, and they would have you do those around meals is go on 15 to 20 minute walks. And so that is tremendously beneficial for stress reduction. The other thing I have patients do is what I call a spiritual triathlon. I, I have them. Uh, say everything they're grateful for, for a couple minutes, mm -hmm. read a Bible or a spiritual growth book for a few minutes, and then just pray for a couple minutes and just doing that to start their day. That is huge for people. Now there are things in terms of, you know, vagal tone response. I mean, there are everything from vibration. Uh, you can get these vibration right. um, tools that, I, that are some of my favorite. There's a, there's a company called Apollo neuro. I think they've got a good, um, they've got a good device, but there are lots of other, many, many others. Um, chiropractic adjustments of the upper cervical spine can benefit this sure. acupuncture is actually fairly effective at this sort of treatment. Um, and then I also love biofeedback. I mean, that's a great tool you can mm -hmm. use, I think as well. So, so, so there are a lot of things I think that can support that vagal tone and relaxation. Those are probably the four that I've done personally and recommended the most. Um, but, but those are, I think I covered most of those. Those are generally, and I also like you know, cold plunge and infrared sauna. I mean, so there's a number of things I like, but the ones I just mentioned earlier, I think are the, are the ones that, um, I probably prefer. Sure. I, it's always right. What's, what's provided by God versus man trying to make the option that is similar to <laughs> red light versus the true infrared light from sunset. Right. Um, and you just can't mimic, I don't think, uh, of course, obviously the, the natural design. Um, so we always try to do that too. It's like, what's the new, the newest thing on the block and, and what's it inspired by <laughs> and how can we go back to the source is usually what, what we tend to recommend to patients. Uh, let's talk a little bit about like nutritionism. And I just want to kind of punch out a couple of things, um, that have been irking me. I'm just curious on your take on them. Uh, oxalates, how important are they to avoid? Are oxalates going to kill everyone? No, no, of course they're not. <laughs> Well, now, I know I mean, from the way I asked, it was uh, kind of leading, I suppose. Now, 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 now let me say this, you know, <laughs> so some people that there, there, there's a small, that some people here, here's what so many people get wrong. And this is why, so I just came out with a podcast myself. Okay. 
And if anybody wants to listen to it, my show is called the Dr. Josh Ack Show. And I go through in this podcast that around 50% of studies that we, we, we read the headline of are false. Think about that. So wow. if you're reading a study, half the time it's, it's false. It's incorrect. And this is based on really, really good data. Let me give you an example. Let's say you read a study that says grass-fed beef or like red meat is bad for your heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if there are 10 studies on it showing it's bad for the heart, there's another 10 studies showing red meat's great for your heart. Sure. How about eggs? How about dairy? How about a certain medication or a certain herb? I mean, so, so, and they go through why, because there's so much bias today. Yes. Um, there is so much, some of these are small scale studies done on like 10 people. A lot of people, times people are cherry picking the data that they want and only putting that in the study. I mean, so, so, so there's a reason why only 50% of the studies, studies are, are correct. And, um, and why you need to read in the five lines and, and it's really the headlines are what you gotta be most aware of. All that being said, here is something most people miss. Um, oxalates are an issue if you have food sensitivities plus the food is raw. Cooking mm -hmm. a food changes a food. Sprouting a food changes mm -hmm. a food. Fermenting a food changes a food. Here's an example of fermentation. I mean, if you're talking about, if somebody says bread is bad, like the whole paleo movement, bread is just bad. Well, okay. Are you talking about wonder bread or right. are you talking about an ancient grain sourdough? That's fermented for 72 hours or 24 or something like that. Like what's it, it's, we're, we're not comparing an and apple made by apple. grandma's hands. Right. I mean, there's even yeah. that, right. The energetics yeah. and the emotions into the food, right. Yeah. If it's homemade in a kitchen with love for loved ones, <laughs> that's a whole different it's, thing. It is very different. Here, here's a, here's a mind blowing study to me. This is very, very. Uh, so we all know celiacs. If somebody has celiac disease, they are very gluten intolerant. I mean, I mean, you have a major gluten sensitivity, right? Um, if they eat gluten, if they have an autoimmune reaction. Um, well, the study's done. They did a study. Now, this is a small study, but on 17 people. And when they had one group of people with celiacs eat this, just it's not even unhealthy bread, just regular bread. And I want to say 13 out of 17 had major reactions, like gut, bloating, distress, pain, like major symptoms. When that same group of 17 people ate sourdough, 0% of them, so 0 out of 17 had any reactions. And this study has been repeated. So, so what happens is when you ferment something, you break it down to where gluten isn't gluten anymore. It's something else. Mm -hmm. and, and your body can better digest it. My whole point there with oxalates is this. If you cook the food, it, it does something to oxalates where it's now easier to digest. There's a difference between raw spinach and cooked spinach. Most of the vegetables I recommend people eat if they have hypothyroidism, autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or a lot of conditions should be cooked vegetables. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if you're a person who has major multiple food sensitivities and major, let's say histamine intolerance, mm -hmm. then oxalates won't help you. They are a sort of food that will create more of that reaction. And so for a period of time, you, you may go lower on oxalates. I mean, so, so I think that there are some people that truly are, uh, can get off oxalate rich foods and that will help them. Um, if they're also getting off all the packaged foods and everything right. else at the same time, cause those are just as bad. Um, but, but no, I mean, listen, the, the, you know, oxalates and lectins and phytic acid, and there's all kinds of things that can be, uh, you know, harmful in the foods we eat, but if the foods are prepared properly, most of the time, it's not an issue for probably 90, you know, high 90 percentile of, of people. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Love that. Uh, let's take on real quick as we're starting to wrap up, um, I'll maybe hit on functional medicine and allopathic medicine, maybe some mainstream medicine wrong turns. So you mentioned birth control and its connection with hypothyroidism, uh, I believe I've heard you speak on antibiotics. I'd, I'd love for you to share with the audience your perspective there. It's interesting when I worked for a physician, uh, 
they would call it the people pleaser. Well, nothing's wrong, but they showed up and took their kid out of school. Give them the people pleaser. Um, and yes. <laughs> it's wow. not a people pleaser, <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe I would love to hear on antibiotics. And then if there's one or two others that are, you know, just maybe overly prescribed, overly utilized and, and how there could be a more root cause intervention. Yeah. Well, well, here, here's the first thing that everybody needs to know. There isn't a single medication that doesn't leach nutrients from your body mm -hmm. and that doesn't damage the, an organ system somewhere in your body. There's not a single medication, not a single one, a baby aspirin. You know, do you know what aspirin is the 15th leading killer in the country, in the United mm -hmm. States ranks 15th. It damages the liver, the intestinal lining and the kidneys. And so it's, so it, and you how know, many even, people the, even the baby aspirin daily, right? Exactly. Per prescribed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you got to realize that again, I mentioned birth, listen, listen to birth control, birth control depletes your body of B1, B2, B3, B6, folate, B12, zinc, magnesium, iron, selenium, and probiotics. Antibiotics, even more than that. Antibiotics deplete your body of every single nutrient because absorption of every nutrient goes down. Yes. Or at least almost every, let, let me not say every, almost every nutrient. There's one or two. I don't think it does. It actually may make them go up actually, but, but, but generally it's pretty much every nutrient. Um, ADHD medications, are those necessary? Those are incredibly overprescribed, incredibly overprescribed. And so, you know, I, I really believe that ADHD is not a, so let me share this. Here is something that I want to kind of tie back into this. And then I'll, I'll come back to your question. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I was not a very good student. I was freshman year English class. I had a teacher and it was Miss Noble. She said, Josh, can you stay after class? I stayed after and she said, Josh, what do you want to do after high school? I said, I want to be a doctor. And the reason I said that was my mom had just gone, had just battled breast cancer the year before I saw her suffer going through chemotherapy. And I thought to myself, I want to help people like my mom not mm -hmm. have to do chemo and to help them heal naturally. And that's why I said, I want to be a doctor. She laughed at me. She said, Josh, listen, my own daughter has a 3.8 GPA. She barely got into med school. She said, with your GPA, you'd never get in. She said, I'd find another profession. She said, also, you got a, you got an F on this paper. You're getting a D minus in my class. You'll be lucky to graduate. And I walked out of there. And then two weeks later, my mom brings me into a doctor who diagnoses me with ADHD. ADHD. Now, here's what he says. And acts, talks to, about me like I'm not in the room. He said, uh, your son has a learning disability. And he's always going to have trouble learning. And then he wrote a, 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 a prescription for a drug called Ritalin. Mm-hmm. And my mom read up on the side effects, decided not to give it to me. Later, I got prescribed Adderall, took it for three days and just felt different. Psychologically mm -hmm. decided to get off of it. Um, but all that being said, I was the kid that was diagnosed with ADHD. A ADHD, listen, if I wanted to focus on something, I could focus on it. Sports, no problem. In fact, mm -hmm. certain, certain topics like... I mean, I didn't mind science and history. I just couldn't, I couldn't focus on math. I, there, there are certain things I couldn't, I couldn't really pay attention in my, my, all that being said, I, uh, yeah. ADHD is one that's cra crazy overprescribed hypothyroid. Now, listen, every medication is overprescribed. That's the truth mm -hmm. right now. Our entire medical system is backwards. Here's how it should work. We, it should be 90% natural and 10% conventional. Today it's 90% conventional, 10% natural. Sure. When somebody has hypothyroidism or anxiety or depression, or you name the condition, they should go into their doctor. Their doctor should say, okay, I'm going to put you on this diet. I'm going to give you these supplements. I'm going to prescribe you to start working out in this way. I'm going to recommend more community. Hey, do you know your purpose? You don't? Let's work on that together. Like, like hey, let's grow spiritually. Like, here are all the things... Here's all the things you can do to beat depression naturally. Mm -hmm. And then after a year of doing everything, if that 1% of people that didn't completely, you know, that didn't see great improvements, because that's all it would be, mm -hmm. still couldn't see an improvement. Okay, hey, now let's get on the antidepressant or the anti-anxiety medication. 
But let's do it for the briefest time possible where we continue to work through this together to keep you off that because we know these drugs deplete your body of a lot of minerals and are going to cause greater depression actually and cause you to have a greater reliance um, on, on this because you're, you're not getting the root cause of the issue. So, so that's the way that the system should work and it doesn't unfortunately i mean even metformin depletes your body of b12 and coenzyme q10 which oh, is yeah. crazy well, well and, and same thing with statin drugs i mean statin drugs deplete your your body of a lot of nutrients that are good for the heart so while a statin drug maybe brings down your a factor of uh of of not dying of one little area like like of heart disease it increases your risk of a heart attack and all kinds of other issues mm-hmm Versus if I would have just given you coenzyme Q10, fish oil, magnesium, and hawthorn in the first place and garlic and said, hey, let's do a little bit better diet wise, you would have seen better results, you know, in, in the first place. And the, what we always love to say, the pleasant side effects, right? <laughs> so instead of yeah. dealing with yeah. dementia as a side effect of statin drugs, when you're using CoQ10 and all those other alternates, the fish oil, et cetera, they might notice cognitive improvement, mood stability, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's wild. Exactly. Well, that, that is the other thing that person with heart issues I just mentioned, they're going to look and feel 15 years younger after they yes. do the supplements and after they yes. start following the lifestyle and diet modifications. I love that. Love that. You're preaching to the choir. Good stuff. Uh, I want to hear you define biblical medicine. I haven't heard that as a phrase before, and you've said it a couple times now. It's interesting because, you know, I had some pretty serious censoring and shadow banning during what I call the bad season, um, which is pandemic time for talking natural medicine. And I found that time to be very trying spiritually and, and have been more outspoken about being a follower of Christ and and dropping biblical verses, et cetera. And it's interesting that I notice just as much censorship <laughs> when I talk God as yeah. when I talk functional medicine. I don't know if you've seen that. I, I just, it, and so it makes me actually want to be louder and braver <laughs> because, you know, yeah. it's like when you know it's right, <laughs> the good stuff. Um, That's right. I, I would just love to hear from you how you define biblical medicine and, and, and a little bit more about that concept as we're bringing this to a close. Right. Well, I, I think bi biblical medicine incorporates, first off, body, mind, and spirit. And it's following both the Old Testament recommendations and the New Testament in terms of what are the best practices in your life to create optimal health. And the Bible, if you look at it, is has so many recommendations for health. Let me give you a few. Um, we know that the Garden of Eden was actually likely what we call a food forest. Mm -hmm. And that's where you've got trees and vines and, and they weren't planting things. They just were there growing. So when we're creating the ideal gardens today, we're doing something called permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and mm -hmm. doing something called food forest creation. And if we were going to make the entire world a garden of Eden, that's what we would do. That's one of the initial callings God had to, for Adam and Eve was to take the garden of Eden and make the entire earth a garden of Eden. So that's one thing we know is that's a great way in terms of even a farming practice of something that we should try and do. Next, we know in Genesis 9, 3, God tells Noah, you can eat meat. And so we know that that can be a basis for part of what we do in the diet. And then from there, we also know that God, a lot of times references everyone from Solomon to David, to Abraham, to Jesus eating meat in sourdough fermented bread. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we know that those can be part of a biblical diet. We know there's the food laws. Don't eat shellfish, bottom feeders, and don't eat pork because they carry parasites. I mean, even if you look in Western medicine, if you study what animal carries by far the most parasites, pork is by far. And if you look at the dirtiest food, look up like dirtiest food of the sea or seafood with the most toxins, shrimp will pull up. If you look on the land, it's pigs. So, so we know that their digestive systems just don't eliminate uh, like other animals. So they're just stores of toxins. And so, you know, that's part of biblical medicine. There's obviously a dietary approach. And I think part of the idea too, it's, it's, it's a mindset, which is whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The Bible is more there, there is a level of subjectivity, which I think sometimes is you want to, you want both. You want to both have structure, like the Ten Commandments of don't do this and do this, but all which is really objective. But you also want some subjectivity to kind of help uh, create a level of flexibility because people are different. 
And right. so the Bible is very prescriptive there. The Bible is very prescriptive in farming practices. Very prescriptive. Let the land rest every seven years. That's one. It doesn't mm-hmm. recommend mono monocropping. They recommend, you know, rotating crops in the Bible. Uh, it's recommended to, um, uh, um, you know, grow, you know, you know, certain sort of, uh, foods and plants anyway. So, so the Bible farming practices are in terms of what it does for regeneration, uh, biblical slaughter methods, how should animal be slaughtered, Mm -hmm. um, to, to reduce the, the stress hormones that are released, um, biblical medicine also moving even into the Bible. Of course, it's spiritual mostly. I mean, Jesus says your faith has healed you, your belief. So your mindset, your beliefs and faith are incredibly important taking a day of rest. I'm not saying people, Christians are held to the law where there's one day and one day only. Uh, but whether that's first off, that that's like one of the only 10 commandments that now we just don't, we, we shouldn't follow. I think there's less of a law about it, but it's more, we should, why wouldn't we take one day off? God did. Right. Everyone right. else did. Jesus did. Why wouldn't we take a day and just rest and just spend it with God and our families? Mm-hmm. It just, of course, that's healthy. Of course you should do that. So, so I think biblical medicine is focused on body, mind, spirit medicine. I think there's a spiritual component. There's a food component. There's an agricultural component. There's a component that recommends a lot of herbs and spices that are referenced within the Bible using, um, using those. Um, and, uh, again, I know that that's sort of a lot of things I said, I'm actually writing a book on this with Jordan Rubin right now. We're writing a book on this diet that's going to come out next year that I think is just going to be. Uh, I mean, it's probably, probably the most excited I've been for any book I've ever written. Uh, we're co-authoring it, but, um, uh-huh. but yeah, so that was, that's, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do a podcast episode here on my podcast too. People could check it out. The Dr. Josh Ack show on biblical medicine here in the next, next, uh, month or so. Um, again, on this, this very topic. Very cool. We'll be sure to link that for listeners. And I think that's, Again, it's it's just a good summary of again, was this provided by nature or is it man-made? <laughs> and and it's a very simple way of looking at food. Um, whether it goes back from your ancestral roots, right, or just gets us out of the nutritionalism of just reading the things of gluten free, free of this, free of that. But well, what is it that we're eating? <laughs> is it real food to begin with? And and it can be so simple. And I think we often overcomplicate, uh, which can create a lot of confusion and, and legalism for sure. For sure. Uh, I would love just to have you share with, we'll, we'll link the, uh, this is going to release mid July. So maybe you'll have already recorded that podcast. We'll definitely of course link your podcast, the book, think this, not that, and all of your past books, but just if you can share with listeners where they can find you, um, and any closing thoughts. Yeah. Well, one, thanks so much for having me on Ali. I've loved being on your, your show. I, um, yeah, I would say if anybody wants to learn more about me, um, I would encourage you to search on YouTube. You could search Dr. Josh Ax. And if there's something specifically you'd like to see me speak on, uh, then just type that in the search. So search Dr. Josh Ax hypothyroid or Dr. Josh Ax anxiety. And I would encourage you, Hey, if you enjoy it, subscribe, leave a comment. would love to hear from you there on the Dr. Josh Ax show on YouTube or Apple or, or Spotify. And then my, my handle on socials at Dr. Josh X. And, um, my new book's called think this, not that it's in bookstores nationwide, or you can just go to Amazon and search Dr. X, think this and check out the new book. Uh, but, uh, Allie, again, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the naturally nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.